Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for coming back to the hashtag Ask Rob series. I have honestly been waiting uh, on pins and needles for this episode because I happened to meet this gentleman when I first moved to Chattanooga, and he so inspired me about this city that um, I just felt like I, I just wanted to sit down and share his flavor and his his background and history on Chattanooga with the folks that are in our audience here at the hashtag Ask Rob series. And the reason why is because no matter what entrepreneur you are, solopreneur, whether you're in a career, you should love your city and understand what your community is about. And Doug has always been that way from everyone that I've ever talked to. He loves his city and he loves his community. And so, you know, if you don't know your city or your community and the history behind it, I just want to recommend that you go do that because I think it's a very important part of being who you are as a professional too. And so, Doug, thanks for being here, man. Really appreciate it. You bet. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to talking with you. Well, let's start off with uh, maybe take a little time machine and uh, let's, uh, you know, kind of roll back and maybe you can kind of give us the, you know, the birthing rights of Chattanooga and why it is where it is and you know, just, I mean, how did we end up here? Well, you know, Chattanooga is where it is for some very compelling geological reasons. Okay. Um, you know, Lookout Mountain and the, the eastern side of, of town is, is basically the southern end of the Smoky Mountains, the southwestern end of the Smoky Mountains, and Signal Mountain and Walden's Ridge and the Cumberland Plateau there, Suck Creek Mountain, Sand Mountain, they're part of the Cumberland Plateau, which is also part of the Appalachian complex. Okay. But it's it's a different it's a different kind of geology. And so you look at look at mountain, it's got that high point on it. It's got peaks and ridges mm -hmm. and signal mountain and the rest of the plateau over there, including Raccoon Mountain, which includes Edna Mountain, which is where Black Creek is, yeah. is flatter on top. Yeah. Although it rises slowly. All the Walden's Ridge runs all the way to Crossville. Yeah, I guess I never noticed that. You're right. I mean, the geology between Lookout Mountain and the other the others around here are are starkly different. Well, there's an amazing thing about Chattanooga that, that about that geology that makes Chattanooga made Chattanooga become where it is, and that is so the the Great Smoky Mountains and the Appalachian Mountains were where a lot of natural resources were that the young people who had come to America were were able to exploit, starting to exploit timber, minerals, all that kind of stuff coming out of the Smoky Mountains, which was pretty rough terrain, right? And so right at, on the western slope of that was the Tennessee River. Well, the rivers were the uh, highways of our young country. We didn't have roads, we didn't have trucks and buses and planes and trains and all that kind of stuff. And so the, high, the, the rivers were the highways. Yeah. The Tennessee River flows down the western slope of this this natural resource bed that is the Smoky Mountains, and to get them to commerce, which was the port cities like New Orleans and places like that, they had to come down the rivers until they got to port cities. And some of this stuff was shipped back to Europe, right? A ton of it was at the beginning. And we don't think about that. But, you know, yeah. the, the, the Spaniards and the English and the French were exploiting this country for its natural resources, sending the stuff back to Europe. Right. I apologize for our dogs. No, that's good. It's flavor. I love it. Yeah. So, um, so in the early period of this country, uh, the southern boundary of the United States was the north shore of the Tennessee River. Okay. And the northern boundary of the Cherokee... I've got to do something about these. I've okay. got to do something about these. We'll hold on. Hang on one second. Right. Can you pause? Yes, we can. I hope this is editable. It is, absolutely. <laughs> We got three dogs and they love to bark. Yeah. Nope. Every that's, child that rides a bicycle by. That's their job. So the the southern end of the United States was the north shore of the Tennessee River. Wow. And the northern end of the Cherokee Nation was the south shore of the Tennessee River. Wow. And so what's curious about Chattanooga is when when we broke that arrangement in eighteen nineteen, mm-hmm. 
or 1830, 18, whenever that arrangement was broken with the Cherokee. Uh, we named our town in their language, Chattanooga, which, uh, as I understand it, means rock coming to a point, but it's definitely a Native American word. Wow. And, but prior to that, the settlement that became Chattanooga was run by the Cherokee chief, John Ross, who was half Scottish and half Cherokee. And, and he established his settlement at Ross's Landing, where the aquarium is now. Yeah, yeah. So it was his, the Cherokees, now think about that from a business perspective, the kind of messages that they're sending to each other back and forth. Of the course. Cherokee named their settlement in English. And the, the, uh, the English or the English-speaking Europeans that were settling the country named their town in Cherokee. In Cherokee. Or in Native American. Anyway, so the river ran through, and for some reason, over millions and millions of years, the Tennessee River had come down and it had hit the point of Lookout Mountain and had taken a U-turn we call Moccasin Bend yeah. and cut a 26-mile wide, 1,000-foot deep canyon, sure. or 26-mile long, 1,000-foot deep wide canyon through Raccoon Mountain, which we call the Grand Canyon of the Tennessee. Sure. I mean... Why it doesn't go into the river complexes that empty out into the Gulf and Mobile, I don't know. But it decides to go tie into the Mississippi River all the way across the state of Tennessee. It actually ties into the Ohio before it gets to the Mississippi. But so, so New Orleans became Chattanooga's access to the sea instead of Mobile. But sure. I, I, I'm not a geologist, but it just looks like a strange way to do, do things. But because of that, the Tennessee River, which was pretty navigable for most of its stretch, had this 26 mile long stretch that had, had these terrible rapids. It had the suck and the pot and the skillet and the pan, yep. Holston's Rock, and then a 10 mile stretch called the Narrows that they had to pull the boats through with, <laughs> with ropes and mules and men. And the, the problem was, that if the river was too low, yeah. the suck would get you. And if the river was too high, you couldn't handle Holston Rock and the pan and the skillet and the rest of that stuff. So they had to wait. Sure, they had to do it and in phases. Ross's landing, yeah. yeah, Ross's Landing was established at this place where uh, the, there was a deep hole there and, and you could stop and the water, you know, you could navigate yeah. to there and you'd have to stop and wait. And so John Ross sets up a trading post. That's fantastic, you know. And that's why Chattanooga is here. You know, you think about the ingenuity in that, right? I mean, you know, he saw the opportunity. And, you know, I mean, as we're sitting here, you know, quarantined per se and going through this this market change and this thing, you know, no matter what market you're in or where you're at, there's always an opportunity if you keep your eye open for it, right? And That's um, right. And so John Ross, he said, you know what, there's an opportunity here. Yeah, he lived down in, in Rossville. Okay. Right, Rossville, Georgia, uh -huh. which is south Chattanooga. It's Chattanooga, Georgia. He actually <laughs> lived down there, but when, when stuff started happening, you know, he moves up and says, I'm going to put up a trading post here where all these Europeans are taking timber and minerals out of the mountains. That's awesome. That's so cool. What a great history. You know, from that standpoint, you know, so, so walk me through this because this is something that I'm very curious about and maybe not a lot of people know about it and I, I know very little about it. So, so now we have this settlement here, right? And so we know that this was a major commerce area because of, you know, the way the river was and how it all got cut in and, and, and the geology behind it all. And so you've kind of given us this flavor of, you know, how the birth and the spark or the, of the fire got started. Um, you know, walk me through a little bit of, you know, fast forward a little bit of, I'm told that there's a town underneath the town. That's right. What does so, that mean? Uh, um, much of downtown Chattanooga, especially as you go toward the river, mm -hmm. uh, was originally on lower ground than okay. it is now. And Chattanooga suffered terrible floods. So the, the yeah, TVA had a profound impact on this town for sure and has saved us a ton but there are pictures from the 1800s of horrendous floods i think 1873 was one 1907 maybe there was another one but and and you know by the time that the uh, business was thriving well enough to have established these storefronts 
and they, they got tired of getting flooded out. So they filled a bunch of the city. Um, uh, and ton, there's, there's tons of stuff still underground. The building at uh, 7th and Cherry that used to have the home plate restaurant and the okay. soup kitchen restaurant and Violet Camera, that mm -hmm. all had, there was a, a big underground basement in there where you could see the sports barn uh, still has markings on the columns of where the water got to. Wow. And so that sports barn, that was on, that was street level, the bottom wow. of the sports barn. Wow. Uh, there was, when there were uh, Miller Brothers and Loveman's were depart department stores down, mm -hmm. downtown, sure. there was a, you could cross underneath the street in a tunnel that was just remaining from when the town was that low. Wow. So they filled a bunch of downtown Chattanooga and they, a lot of it got covered up, but some parts of it are still used as basements and things like that. Interesting. Very, very interesting. So, you know, obviously your family has been here for quite a while and, and those kind of things. And so with the, with the advent of, you know, transportation and roads and stuff, and I know your family has been in construction and that kind of thing. So, you know, what's kind of led to the, the next phase of Chattanooga as it moved off the water and, you know, rail obviously is a big thing here. Um, and then, you know, as we moved into automobiles and that kind of thing. So, so how did that kind of transform Chattanooga? Because from what people have told me in the past, we were very heavy manufacturing for a long time. Very, very heavy. It was called the Dynamo of Dixie. Okay. And um, I'll share them with you. I have recently uncovered, you know, 20 year plans for the industrial growth of Chattanooga. And my grandfather was president of the Chattanooga Industrial Development Corporation, which was a adjunct of the Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chattanooga had tons of huge industry, U.S. Pipe and Wheeland Foundry. Wheeland Foundry was here from 1867, I think, to uh, um, 1999. Or they were wow, the, one of the oldest run. businesses in Chattanooga. And so what happened was after the war, Mm -hmm. you know, Chattanooga was this rail hub and because of its position on the river, it had become uh, a trading post, a, a nexus of communication and transportation and logistics at that time. They didn't use that word, but, but the train stations all ran through here and it was considered vital to defeating the South was to control the rails and control Chattanooga. So the, you know, the famous general, locomotive that is part of the symbol of the city of Chattanooga was uh, a Confederate yeah. locomotive yeah. that was stolen. Sure. Um, so, you know, when Sherman came through, you know, Grant besieged the city for a long time. And then when Sherman came through, they ripped the rails up all over that. Well, in that period, a lot of union soldiers, mostly uh, officers thought, boy, this is a beautiful place. <laughs> Yes, and they all had to stop and have their picture taken on, on Point Park and on the mountains. There, there was a guy that had a, a photography studio, that, studio there, a, a wet plate kind of glass sure. negative yeah. Yeah. thing. And, and they all had to stop and have their picture taken. I have several pictures subsequent to that of generations of my family with their picture taken on Umbrella Rock, wow. which you can't sit on anymore, but they used to sit on it. <laughs> I, I, probably lost lives doing stuff like that. But, <laughs> uh, mm. They, uh, so these Confederate, I mean, these union yeah. uh, officers came back down here and established businesses. You know, yeah. they knew how to do something and they came down here and started doing it and built Chattanooga a lot. They carpet baggers, yeah. they were called. Of course. And, and that's, uh, I, I think to this day that that's part of the reason that the Chattanooga uh, character is less partisan because mm -hmm. there were a lot of Yankees that came down here. Gotcha. It wasn't all Southerners. And I, in, my, in my family, I had people on both sides of my family fighting the battle of, I, I mean, both sides of my family fight on both sides of the war at sure. Chickamauga and in Chattanooga. Wow. So... So that's an interesting, no, that's an interesting way to look at the culturalization, you know, of, of Chattanooga is that it, you know, really was a melting pot between, you know, these, these opposing forces at the time. Um, but still when, you know, when everything came to an end there, um, 
the beauty of this place and the magic of this place was enough to draw them all back. And, uh, and yeah, and Chattanooga lives. was kind of a political melting pot too, in a way, because of where it was. So it, during the Civil War, there was a, a large piece of East Tennessee, especially Northeast Tennessee, that would not, did not want to secede from the Union. And they did not have slaves. And they were hard scrabble, Scots Irish farmers. <laughs> And uh, my family had, was from that part of the country, and they almost formed their own state called Franklin back during the Revolution. Before, wow. you know, this was North Carolina. Yeah. Tennessee was North Carolina at the time of the Revolution. Sure. The state so of Tennessee was formed in 1794 or huh? So they wanted to that. form the state of Franklin up in Northeast Tennessee because they were so much different from the western part of the state where there were large plantations and things. And Chattanooga was a place where those people came together because we were the transportation and logistical hub. So that's one of the, one of the things that I attribute our unique uh, tolerance and, and diversity to in thought for sure. Sure. Well, you know, part of this conversation today is I really just wanted to plant a seed for people to, you know, to begin to love and understand not only where they live, but also begin to understand and maybe dive into a little bit more about, you know, what Chattanooga is all about. So let's fast forward just a little bit um, and take us into the next evolution because, you know, I have a really good friend who grew up in, um, who grew up, um, you know, just just around the bend and he would come to UTC to go to school and he would tell me about all the manufacturing and how Chattanooga was, you know, was very polluted for a period of time because of the industrialization and those kind of things. Um, you know, but obviously that's far different than from what it is today. So what led the transformation from this major manufacturing hub and all these foundries and you know this stuff going on to where we are today i mean what what kind of led through that process what did you see i was really really very fortunate and i might even cry when i think about uh, the role that jack clepton played in in all that happened one man one man play was the guy in my opinion that, that drove the most of it now a whole lot of people had to join him Mm -hmm. but uh his family his grandfather had had uh, had the idea i think with a couple of other guys to bottle coca-cola which was a fountain drink and he and his grandfather was a lawyer and he uh established a contract with the the folks that had the recipe and the bottling right and, and they retain the bottle rights to bottle and distribute the soft drink wow. and that turned out to be a really really good business deal <laughs> yeah, yeah i think <laughs> and so uh, there were a, a few chattanooga families that were trading those those uh those rights to stock in their companies i'm mm -hmm. sure sure and and jack lupton the lupton family ended up with a huge portion of it mm -hmm. and they i mean they built baylor school basically they funded baylor school okay. for a long time where i went to high school mm -hmm. um they they did a lot for chattanooga but mostly it was built around coca-cola and they were doing philanthropic things well jack decided to sell his bottling rights back to Coca-Cola Consolidated in the early 80s after he had built the honors course, mm. which was a, a nice thing to have down, you know, yeah. this is the first nice so. thing. Yeah. And um, he, I was actually with him in the car with Pete Dye, the golf course architect, no way. and Gene Ragsdale, the bartender out there was driving, and I was sitting mm. in the passenger seat and, and the two lions were sitting in the back seat and pete and jack had just sold jtl to coke and pete said what are you going to do now that you're unemployed <laughs> and uh mr lupton could be pretty profane at times and i thought that we were going to hear some of that but instead he he got kind of reflective and he said my town's had a hard time and i want to help it mm. And 
soon after that, I didn't know what I was hearing. I was in my twenties. Uh, soon after that, they formed Chattanooga venture or something like that on what became river city company or river valley partners they've had various names but and he hired a bunch of young guys some of whom were teachers at Baylor school uh rick montague his son-in-law you know people were looking at this and they were just not trusting it and i understand why they weren't trusting it but but they were just wrong he he said, figure out what we got to do to fix this city and get together the best minds you can get together. And they came up with this thing that's now called the Chattanooga process where they, we had uh, visioning our city. What do we need to go? What do we need to do? And I went to these, that they, these young guys went and embraced the whole city, everybody, anybody could come. All were welcome. What do you think we ought to do? And the city basically decided we want to reclaim our river, wow. which was, which was industrial riverfront and sure. polluted and looked like hell. And <laughs> nobody went there and nobody, you wouldn't swim in it. And nobody fished in it. I mean, it was, it was a bad situation. The town was in a bad way. Wow. And they came back with the idea that we need to reclaim the river. And, and the first thing we need to do is build an aquarium. And I, I was told, and I, I knew these people and was yeah. kind of there on the edges, but of I course. wasn't a mover and a shaker. I was just an observer. Um, they came back to him and they said, we think we need to build an aquarium on the riverfront. And he looked at him and said, that just sounds silly. I, I hope I didn't just waste a bunch of money on paying you guys to go come back with this. And, uh, they said, let us show you. And they took him to the Monterey Aquarium, I think, and to maybe Baltimore and Boston. Wow. And he came back and he says, okay, I'll pay for it. <laughs> so, but he knew, he knew from his experience at Baylor School. So the Lupton family had kept Baylor School afloat for the most part. Mm -hmm. and, my, and I heard the stories from my grandfather, who was a, one of the permanent trustees of the school. And, you know, they would get to the end of the year and, and uh, Carter Lupton would turn to Joe Con Guild and, and Scotty Probasco or Colonel Probasco or whoever would, somebody else on the thing says, the school's run a million dollar deficit. I'll take half of it. You two take a quarter of a piece. And that's how they did things. And, and Jack realized that that was bad for the school because right. they came to expect it. He said, everybody needs to be involved. Now Baylor's got a huge annual fund and, and everybody got involved, but it didn't used to be that way. Mm. And so um, he did the same thing here in Chattanooga. He, he put in the lion's share, but then he, but then they raised money from everybody. Sure. They could raise money from, including sure. our company. We, you know, I made yep. it uncomfortable yep. with a large donation. <laughs> and, uh, but everybody jumped in yep. and, and then they got the city to, to do pay for the part around it, the, the park, which is a very compelling piece of architecture. And it's beautiful. Yeah, the site, the tail of the Indians and Ross's Landing is something else that'll make cry. But, uh, you know, that's how that got started. And, and that jump started the whole renaissance of Chattanooga, the reclaiming of the Walnut Street Bridge, which was slated to be torn down, and the beautification uh -huh. and use of the Market Street Bridge and all those trails and Coolidge Park and the uh -huh. Corker-led 20, 21st century riverfront and all that yeah. stuff. I yeah. mean, that, that all owes itself to Jack Lupton saying, I need to help my town. Wow. That's, you know, see, this is, you know, again, this is part of um, understanding the history, to, you know, because, and it goes back to from my professional experience, Doug, and I know you know it too, is, you know, people only see the results. They don't see the journey, right? And the journey right. is where the juice is. The journey is where the real, the real growth and the real opportunity is, is understanding the journey and not just the results. And, um, and that's why I've been so excited about, you know, I mean, every, ever since I met you and your family, I've, every time I'm around any of you out, I'm always excited because you love this place and it just oozes out of you. And, um, 
And I'm just so happy our family moved here and just, you know, because I have gotten to learn um, a lot about Chattanooga through you guys. And, um, and I continue to learn more. And so I just wanted to share this, this time with, you know, the audience here at the hashtag Ask Rob series is, is just don't look at the results around you. Get into the journey and understand the journey because there's a real story and a real flavor there. And, um, and I hope you got that feeling from Doug today. And Doug, man, thanks for just being you. <laughs> ah, well, I appreciate it. I, I really enjoyed it. And oh, uh, be happy to talk to you about anything yeah well like at some that. Point, yeah at some point there's i know there's a few other projects that uh, i definitely have in mind that i'd like to get your take on you know here in chattanooga you know i'd like to talk about you know just tva i'd like to talk about the whole gig city side of things i'd like to talk about black creek and just you know um you know your vision behind that as an entrepreneur and you know going through the ups and downs in life um, there's plenty of more we can talk about, and I'd love to continue. If you'd be a guest, I'd love I'd love to continue to have you on. I'd, I'd love to do it. In a, in a time when we're having kind of a crisis of trust, which is the thing that makes human beings successful, you know how awkward it feels right now when you go to the store and you're afraid somebody else has got the disease. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, trust is what is the bedrock on which all relationships and all business hinge. Yeah. And we, you know, I want, all of us to to return to trust in one another sure we we have to restore ourselves this is a short-term thing in my opinion yeah i agree too i think it's a you know as much as it is a a tragedy for a lot of people personally and very close um it's also an opportunity to reset i think and i think we've been given an opportunity to reset a little bit and right um, so you know. far, it's been a good thing for our business. It's caused us to kind of up our game a little bit to, sure. to still provide a service and stay in business mm -hmm. for our customers, our members, and our, our buyers it's out at Black Creek. And it's, uh, you know, we've gotten a lot of good, it's been a lot of good discipline for us. That's good. And we've learned how to do things on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're ever going to go back. There's going to be some real changes and uh, you know, that's going to be some good stuff though, you know, and sometimes we need a good push, you know, just like a, just a walking baby. Sometimes, you know, you need that little push to, you know, let go of something and start, you know, start walking. And so, you know, this might be a little good push for us. So. Okay. I think so. All right. Well, listen, boss, man, you know, I think the world of you and your family, thanks for taking the time. And, um, you know, I, I plan on having you back. Hey, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this um, episode of the Hashtag Ask Rob series. It's a little, you know, it's a little, a little adjacent to what we normally do, but I thought it was important because um, I do think, you know, in these moments, in these times, we can find ways to uh, continue to educate ourselves, continue to go deep, to build relationships, um, understand even just the place you live. Do you understand even where you live and why you are where you are and what the history is behind it? Um, you know, so, so take that time and look for those opportunities. And Doug, thanks for, thanks for showing us the way. Thanks for lighting the way. Well, I appreciate what you do and, uh, and I wish you all the best with it, Rob. Thank you. All right, all right boss, man. We'll talk to you soon. We'll right. see you on the next one. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>